Greetings and welcome to this uh, episode. Uh, in this case, we're doing lecture cast four of your summer assignment, and uh, we're continuing our um, our evaluation and our look at the crisis uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, we've talked about um, the plague. We've talked about the Hundred Years' War. We've talked about the um, the, the, the problems, the crisis in the uh, Catholic Church. Today, we're going to look at the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, which led to uh, a new age of learning and the development of nationalist uh, literature. Uh, before we get started, I want to give you a did you know, so now you know, um, pretty much fact of useless information. So today, I'll share this with you. The English invented football, and uh, which is known in America as soccer, when they kicked around the heads of Danish invaders that they had slaughtered. So there's a little bit of useless information for you. Um, so today, as I said, we're going to go into the fall of the Byzantine Empire, and uh, we're going to talk about why that's such a big deal. Um, basically, what you need to know is the Byzantine Empire had been the dominant power in southeastern Europe for nearly a thousand years. Um, one of the things you need to go back to, if you haven't watched the Dark Ages uh, footage that I put on the uh, website, uh, from the History Channel, you know, again, re referring to there, if you look on this map, the, the Justinian Empire around the 6th century, and the Hagia Sophia, uh, and, and things like that, that you, you should be a little bit familiar with. That's what we're talking about, the Byzantine Empire. Um, and it began uh, as the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, and lasted long after the Roman Empire had, in fact, disappeared. The Greek, or Greek Orthodox Church, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, was dominant in the Byzantine Empire. So what ends up happening in uh, 1453, the Muslim Ottoman Empire took Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, um, uh, as its last major stronghold. And uh, here's live action footage of that siege of Constantinople in 1453. But what we need to look at here is why that is such a big deal. And the fact is that the fall of the Constantinople, uh, the city of Constantinople in 1453 was significant and had a significant impact on what we're going to talk about here in chapter 12, which is the Renaissance. And in fact, Renaissance humanism in Italy. Because what ended up happening was a flood of manuscripts from ancient Greece, which were preserved uh, by the Byzantines. And the only reason why these exist, uh, because they survived the Dark Ages, is because um, they were welcomed and they were protected uh, in the Byzantine Empire. And in fact, they were transported to Florence. As you guys will learn, uh, Florence will be the capital of the Renaissance. Um, some scholars from the Byzantine Empire fled westward to Italy after the Turks conquered uh, Constantinople to escape Turkish and Muslim rule. So the West will benefit uh, from those scholars fleeing the East and coming into the West. And what they did, in fact, they brought with them many of those ancient Greek manuscripts with them, uh, ushering in a new phase of Renaissance Italy that saw a rebirth of Greek culture, which is the Renaissance. And again, Roman culture and the study of Latin had dominated uh, the early Renaissance prior to 1450. And what we're going to start to talk about here is the Greek, the original Bible written in Greece, or, or Greek, excuse me, was written in Greece. Um, and that's going to change a lot of things religiously as we move on as well. So these Greek scholars, um, fearing that the Ottoman Empire might destroy those ancient manuscripts because they were um, you know, again, um, they weren't Eastern in thought, they weren't Muslim in thought. Um, they smuggled them into Italy for safety. Uh, and again, as Ron Burgundy would say, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, it's going to usher in that new age of uh, learning and thought uh, that we're going to talk about as humanism. So what ends up happening is the Ottoman Empire spreads northeastward into Europe, and they took control of the, the Balkan Peninsula here. Um, and, and they're going to continue to, uh, you know, approach and, and attack Western Europe all the way into uh, the 16th and, in fact, the 17th century. So this isn't going away. We're going to be talking about that. And um, uh, again, like I said, they're going to eventually threaten Central European regions of Hungary and Austria. And we'll talk about that even as we progress through the Reformation. So, um, and again, the, the, the last part of this particular presentation is nationalist literature that uh, developed in the later Middle Ages. And uh, although it's not specifically tied to the fall of the Byzantine Empire, I think it's important to, uh, to kind of talk about this at this particular time. And so what we see is the rise of uh, the use of vernacular or national languages, uh, anything that's not Latin, as we said, um, the church... Uh, in the West had dominated learning, dominated everything uh, in, in life. And uh, in this case, you know, what you had was everything 
uh, in Latin. If you could not read Latin, you couldn't read. You couldn't read the Bible. Uh, you couldn't read really uh, anything because that was the um, th that was the uh, the language of learning. And so what we start to see here in the late Middle Ages, as the Renaissance approaches, is more and more people start to uh, write and record uh, novels you know just about everything in terms of learning in these national languages and what that's going to allow is more and more people to understand and more and more people uh, to uh, to become literate and, and to be able to uh, engage in discussions and thought uh, whereas prior to that they really didn't have that opportunity and the first person uh, that we talk about in terms of uh, you know also considered an early renaissance figure is Dante Alighieri and uh, he wrote in the vernacular uh, of Tuscan Italy, and uh, you know, instead of Latin. And one of the things that we need to know here, if you want to write this down, is he wrote the Divine Comedy in about 1321. And it was an epic poem written, as I said, in the T Tuscan dialect. It was divided into three parts, and it tells uh, a story of Dante's journey through inferno, or hell, purgatory, and paradise, or heaven. Uh, and the Latin poet Virgil serves as Dante's guide through Inferno and Purgatory, while Beatrice, uh, Dante's ideal woman, uh, in his, is his guide through heaven. And uh, the use of Virgil really represents reason and the values of classical civilization. And, and get used to hearing about the antiquity and classical civilization because uh, obviously we're going back to ancient Greece and with these manuscripts coming over. Uh, as I said, it's just going to kind of captivate people's interest and attention to the ancient Greeks, and it's going to stimulate the movement as we know um, uh, as the Renaissance. And um, while you know we talked about Dante uh, representing or, or uh, Virgil representing what he represented, but Beatrice represents love, faith, and divine revelation. Uh, Geoffrey Chaucer is another one of these people that uh, started to develop a vernacular. In this case, we're talking about England, and in I'm sure you've read this in your English classes, Canterbury Tales, he portrays English life. Um, and again, we're getting away from the church, we're getting uh, into, um, you know, themes and discussion of events that actually affect people's lives, and again, they're, they're written in the vernacular. vernacular. Um, Francois Villon uh, wrote the Grand Testament, 1461, and portrayed ordinary French life with humor and emotion. Uh, greatest poet of medieval France and again in the end you're probably thinking who big deal who cares why do I have to learn this but you have to understand that this is the beginning of a huge trend people weren't only centered on Latin as the language as I've already indicated and it's going to lead uh, to more and more books and more and more knowledge um, you know being able to be understood being written and spread into that language familiar with familiar with more and more people um, factor this in with mass production of materials uh, and later uh, included in that mass production the printing press and you have the makings of a rebirth quote unquote uh, and knowledge is around the corner and that means ladies and gentlemen that the middle ages or as Petrarch coined the phrase the dark ages are on their way out thanks for listening uh, as always if you have any questions please don't uh, hesitate to come see me or email me um, uh, on my class website. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.